Thank you, Paul, and thanks all for having me. Um, uh, before I start, there, just a few reflections and, uh, and comments. So uh, I was thinking as I was arriving, it kind of felt like a, a trip home after having the first. I hadn't realized it was 2012, the um, the first Coin Scrum event in that pub in Paddington. The one I actually remember was the, and I don't know if Paul remembers this, was the, um, the impromptu open outcry Bitcoin trading you did on Brick Lane a year or two later. Do you remember that? Um, <laughs> And, and I remember, I remember because I wrote, I wrote a blog post about it. And the thing that I found utterly fascinating about that was how spontaneously in this sort of like dark room, yeah, you were there, you were there, that dark, that dark room was, it wasn't just the trading that happened. You know, people were actually writing down the, the, the trades they'd committed to and little bits of paper that then all got sorted out at the end. Like an impromptu process of clearing and settlement um, just immediately, spontaneously occurred at the back of this. Like the, the, the history doesn't, doesn't repeat, but it certainly echoes. Um, second comment was just thank you to Arthur. Um, it's so easy in these debates just to go on the attack and rather than make the case for what you're building yourself, just to go and attack the opponent and say why they're, um, you know, why, why they're idiots, even when given a really wide open goal that you could go and kick into. So thank you for, thank you for keeping, it, um, keeping it above the belt. So I don't think I've got an easy job, but I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try and do three things. I'm going to spend most of my time on the first two and I'll, I'll gloss over the third, but I think it is relevant because I think that's where these, 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 um, these worlds come back together. I'm going to try and convince you of, of two, if not three things. The first is that these things I call enterprise blockchains. And I'll come on to this, the reason for that in a moment, because I'm not convinced the open, closed, permission, permissionless distinctions are actually as clear cut as they look. So I'm going to make the case for these things I call enterprise blockchains, but you, know, you decide whether you think this is a meaningful distinction. So I'm... If even 10% or 20% of the people in this room um, have changed their mind and leave this room thinking that, you know what, maybe Rich is onto something, maybe there actually is something novel and of value here, then I'll regard that as a success. What I then go on to do is then explain why we went, you know, we are three, we the R3 community, why we went on this seemingly insane journey to then go and build our own platform. You know, building a platform is really, really hard. You know, I'm sure Arthur would attest to that. Anyone who's tried it, it's hard to do it. So why did we go build Corda? Even if we convinced ourselves this was something that was necessary, why didn't we just reuse something that already existed? Why didn't we take something off the shelf or adapt it? You know, why did we build our own thing? Um, and then at the end, I'm going to make a bit of an apology because, you know, in my my writings, I often take swipes, usually at the other enterprise blockchains, you know, Clearmatics, I'm sure there are some of those guys in the room at the enterprise Ethereum variants and Hyperledger. But I'm going to apologize because if we're going to make progress as a community, it's already fairly clear how this is going to shake out, what some of the big players are going to be. And we need to start working together to make sure these things can interoperate. You know, side chains is one approach if you're in the Bitcoin space, but there are a bunch of other things you have to do. And, um, and just yelling at each other on medium posts doesn't really help. So three things I'm going to try to do. One is, you know, why do I think this space actually as distinct from public blockchains is, is relevant and interesting. Um, why did we build Corda? And then what's a possible approach to, to uh, improving the debate around interoperability? So the way I thought I'd, I'd set this up was, was to imagine that I'd been asleep or someone, a computer scientist had been asleep not for the last 10 years, not since the birth of Bitcoin, but probably for the last 15 years. So you'd missed the entire public blockchain um, revolution. You'd missed Bitcoin, but you'd also missed the financial crisis. You didn't have that context. And then one day, maybe in 2019, you woke up and the first thing someone showed you was a live full Bitcoin node. So you're looking at this thing and you know, maybe you'd be interested by this funny internet money. You wouldn't, you wouldn't quite get the importance because you'd miss the financial crisis. You're not an economist, remember, you're a computer scientist. And, and you, see this, you see this thing running. And then you're told that there are thousands, you know, potentially thousands of other copies of this Bitcoin full node you know, running around the world. And they're all within some bounds, perfectly in sync. So you know that when so, so you so you suddenly come to believe and realize that this system you're looking at that all it's telling you is you know how many bitcoins there are and you know, ultimately who owns them or what you need to do to spend them but you're told that there's this system that keeps all these different computers in sync and yet the people who are running these computers don't know each other don't, but they certainly they may not know each other they certainly don't trust each other and there's no CEO of this network there's, there's no one running it there's a few things that might follow so first of all, there's the obvious thing, which is, oh my God, there's this new digital currency. And if you pick up on that, and maybe you've got a bit, bit of economics knowledge, or maybe you hadn't actually slept through the financial crisis, all the excitement that I suspect everybody in this room went through would, 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 you know, would follow, this person would go down the rabbit hole as, 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 as everyone else did. Um, but if you're looking at it just through a computer science mindset, and I guess this is the point that Arthur made as well, is you look at it and think, hang on, this is a really interesting um, example of, um, you know, of applied distributed systems, of applied consensus 
consensus technology. Someone's finally taken, or someone's taken a, you know, a variant of the, um, you know, the systems that were first you know, built or talked about in papers 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and actually implemented one for real. We've now got a distributed system executing some sort of consensus algorithm at scale, and guess what? It actually works. And that was really our st stepping off point because the question you could ask yourself is, well, if I had one of those, you know, what could I use it for? If I generalize this and I don't look too closely at the economics to start with, because I'm going to come back to that, but I want to take it down a different path first. If I was to look at that and say, you know, what can I do with a system that allows me to know for sure that the computer I'm looking at is in sync with other people's computers who I may want to transact with, but I don't fully trust, and where there's no single identifiable entity that's making it so, you know, what can I do with one of those things? Um, and of course, if you, if you generalize it to that extent, you very quickly, you very quickly effectively get to this insight, which is you know, that's a, that, that is the problem that every business faces. You know, the last 40, 50, 60 years of, 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 of IT, certainly for businesses, has been about you know, optimizing or improving how an individual firm operates. You know, implement an ERP system to improve your supply chain, and to implement a CRM system to improve how you track your customers, make sure there's a single source of truth, make sure everybody's operating on the same data. But when you move that problem from the firm to a network of firms you know, to an entire market, it's effectively an unsolved problem. Yes, we've got messaging systems. Yes, we've got electronic data interchange. We've got all these things that are attempting to bring different computers and different firms into sync. But none of them really work. You know, it is always, it is inevitably the case that whenever two or more firms are trying to transact, they always then need to go and reconcile to check that they're seeing the same thing. You know, I do a trade with you. Do we actually agree how much I owe you? I've lent you some money. Do we actually agree what the uh, interest payment is? You scale that up to the sort of like the, to a whole market, whether it's for trade finance or whether it's an in insurance. You, you end up in a situation where business that could get done simply doesn't get done because all the people who should be operating off the same data invariably are not. And until this, and, and, and I agree with Arthur on this, like there was no new breakthrough in sort of fundamental computer science research. Um, but until people started looking at what had been achieved in the public blockchain communities with things like Bitcoin and what came after, I don't think anyone had really thought or really, it really occurred to them to say, you know what, maybe we can take another attempt at solving this problem. Because until, until we tried again, there were only really you know, one, two, maybe three distinct ways of solving it. One was you just didn't. You, know, you, you sent data around whether it was structured or unstructured, and then had to reconcile all the data. That meant you moved slowly. You couldn't act on data. You couldn't act on opportunities as fast as you might. Or to the point, I guess, at the, uh, the back of the room earlier, you, you anointed some centralized party as, 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 as the leader of that industry or that market. You'd introduce a central counterparty in the financial markets. You'd, you'd create some sort of utility that became the source of truth of that market. And you said, you know what? It's all too hard. You decide. You're in charge. Whatever you say is the truth. Or you'd run it all on one big database in the cloud, and whoever, whoever controlled that database was in charge of that market. But, you, but, but then we look at how you might apply some of these, you go back to these insights, you say, well, actually, if I could somehow take some of these insights from what was delivered with Bitcoin and these other technologies, if I could get to a point where I've got my computer that I run my business on, and you've got your computer that you run your business on, and we're guaranteed that they're in sync on the things we care about, and yet we don't have to introduce new third parties to make it so, maybe that's a new way of making business at the level of a market run more, more efficiently. So I'll come on to some examples of you know, where we're actually doing that. But that was the stepping off point. You know, that was really the first few months of the work we did at R3 back in 2015, once we got started. Now, back then, we were a consortium of financial institutions. And, you know, where I think we first hit the news when there were nine, 12, then you know, sort of like dozens and dozens of, of banks who were working on this. But quite rapidly, what we realized was this, this, this insight to the extent it's an insight, this idea that if we could somehow d deliver software that runs at the level of a market, we could drive huge cost savings, but also enable new opportunities. We very rapidly realized that that, that transcends uh, markets. That's, that's, that's a cross-industry thing. It's not just a financial thing. Um, so that was, that was the problem or the opportunity we thought we could go after. The problem was, if you follow that chain of logic, what you don't end up with is an answer that says, and therefore we should deploy Bitcoin in every major bank of the world, or an argument that says, therefore we should deploy Ethereum in every insurance company. Because where we'd ended up effectively was a set of requirements. There was a set of requirements that said, we would like a system that allows you to write an application, or to write code that automates or improves how an entire market operates. You know, I, want, I want to encapsulate, I want to encode the business logic of this indicated lending market. I want to encapsulate the business logic of some part of the reinsurance market 
and then deploy it into every firm of that market so that they're all in sync and they can, they can do their business together more effectively and they can enable new opportunities. But that's a requirement statement. That's, that's a requirement for what the system must do. It's not a description of a system that actually exists. And when we worked through those requirements, quite a few annoying little things came out. You know, a, a few annoying little things that didn't lead us to, to have the ability to deploy what already existed. So just to give a few examples, because this leads on to why we ended up building Corda. You know, first requirement would be, well, if, if I'm trying to model real-world interactions as opposed to you know, store value and, and, and move um, anonymous digital currency around, I actually need to know with whom I'm transacting. I actually need to know that if I'm trying to record a deal I've done with HSBC or with, you know, with, with a manufacturer in, in Birmingham, I need to know I've actually recorded the deal with them and I actually have a legally binding contract with that firm. I need identity, I need an interlock to the legal system. I actually have a strong need for privacy. So, so I agree with Arthur that there is a roadmap to privacy for some of the, um, some of the public blockchains, but we needed it today. So I couldn't build this platform with an architecture that sent all data to everybody and had everybody collaborate over the, 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 you know, the structuring of an entire single blockchain. Because I needed to ensure that if I've done a deal with two people in, these in this room, we're the only people who know about it and nobody else does. I had this really annoying requirement, which was this has to work with the real world. I have to be able to integrate this with existing systems. You know, if you know, the current world runs on systems like written in C Sharp or COBOL or Java, I need to be able to integrate with those systems easily. It can't be its own little world if it's going to make a difference. So you actually, and, and, and you actually have to have people who can write applications who, who are average people, you know, average developers, you get off the market, who go and work for regular firms. It has to be easy to write for these things. So long story short, we began on this journey, this, this journey that led to Corda, which was an attempt to solve that problem, to allow us to, to, to deploy applications to entire markets that were built on the principles that uh, many of the principles that Arthur outlined, but yet were able to solve problems in business that, that could get deployed in, in, you know, in the near future. So, so I'm not here to do a sales pitch for Corda. It was, it was great that Arthur didn't do one for Tezos because nobody wants to hear these things. So I'll just leave this chart up and just point on a couple of them to just show two of the things that we did differently because we needed it. Um, so I've talked about you know, it has to, tedious stuff like it has to integrate with existing systems. Um, but the other thing was, and this is quite interesting because it caused quite a lot of controversy um, a couple of years ago. As we worked through all these requirements, we didn't encounter a need for, to build a batch system. What we discovered was each transaction that a company has, um, has engaged in, they want it confirmed as soon as possible, and they want it confirmed with finality. The need to batch several of these up together you know, into a block effectively and have them all confirmed at once, that requirement didn't emerge, so we didn't build it in. So we, we effectively built a real-time system where each transaction just goes to those who need it and those who may need subsequently to verify it for provenance reasons, um, and I'm sure we'll get onto that later. And then it's confirmed immediately. And again and again and again, what we kept hearing from people was, I do not want to be told this transaction has been confirmed, and then a bit later I get told it's become unconfirmed. You know, I need to know when I can rely on the fact that something has happened. So, so for those reasons and more, you know, we, we, we built what we did. But that's quite abstract, it's quite theoretical. Um, so I thought I'd give an example that hopefully sort of like makes it, makes it real and, and shows that this isn't just a centralized database and it isn't some sort of like, you know, I, I don't really understand this idea of a consortium database, but I'll give an example and, and see whether you agree with me. So the example I'm going to give is from a company called Finastra. So Finastra are one of the, you may know them as, if you work in the financial sector, you may know them as MySys, which was their name before they merged with D&H. Um, and they're one of the largest um, financial software firms in the world. And pertinent to this discussion, they produce a piece of software called Loan IQ that manages most of the syndicated loans in the, um, in the world. And I didn't know anything about syndicated lending before um, before I joined R3. Um, but it's almost just it's almost like an example of almost it's it's a, it's a microcosm of pretty much every market in the world, because syndicated lending, like most markets, the syndicated lending market is an inherently decentralized market. You know, the setup effectively is you know we're just around the corner from the from the Moorgate Cross Rail Station. Large infrastructure projects or anyone in any firm who needs to borrow a lot of money typically cannot get one bank to lend it to them. So the issue they've got is they need to. They need someone who can help them find a collection of people, a syndicate, who, who collectively will lend them that money. So this is a decentralized process. If I need to borrow a billion dollars or $10 billion to go build a station or whatever it is, I have a choice of banks, agent banks as they're called, to go to to help me do this. So there's some decentralization there. And then they've got an entire roster of lenders they can, they, 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 they can assemble their syndicate from um, in order to help do that. So, there's, so there's, there's no one in charge. There's no central point of control for this network, just a whole web of relationships and contracts that, that exist between all these different firms. 
And as a result, this market looks just like pretty much every other market, which is all the firms in that market have pretty much optimized the hell out of the, uh, optimized the hell out of how they how they operate, both their IT and their people and all the rest. But the communication between those firms, it's literally still email, fax, telephone, and, um, and post. You know, there's, there's almost no automation to note between these firms, even though the majority of them are all running the same software within the walls of their own banks. You know, it's, it's kind of nuts, but it's what happens when you don't actually have anybody in charge and there's, and there's no one to force this change. What Finastra figured out was, well, hang on, if we were just to go and operate a centralized database or offer to operate one, Everybody would see right through that. You know, exactly to Arthur's point, you know, it would be the, it would just be such an easy opportunity to extract a rent or to 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 assert control. That isn't going to work. They started looking at the enterprise blockchain space. They chose Corda. I'm sure they could have chose something else and said, actually, this works with the grain of the market, not against it. The market is decentralized. The market is point to point. Corda is point to point. If we were to deploy a Corda node in each of these major firms, deploy this, this thing they're calling Lendercom, but you know, the, the details don't matter that much, um, deploy this application um, onto each of them, we could with not much effort, massively improve the amount of information and the quality of the information that flows between these firms in a way that makes loans you know, process themselves far more efficiently, reduce costs, ultimately reduce interest rates, so it's actually beneficial to everybody. Um, but without introducing, this is the key point, without introducing any new points of control or any new third parties, which is why... and, and that's phase one. It sounds quite dull, just information flow. But the vision is actually quite interesting. You know, phase two is this becomes the authoritative record for who owns these tranches. Phase three enables a new um, market um, for the secondary trading of these things. So there's an, there's, there's an entire piece of you know, opportunity that comes off the back of it. But I labor all these points because you know, until this, 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 this technology came along and, and showed the way, this was an opportunity that there was, there was, it, was, it was hitherto unaffordable or hitherto in, too intractable a problem to go try and solve this problem. So there's genuine, there are genuinely new problems being solved that previously weren't. But to solve this problem, you needed identity. You needed to be able to write the um, application in languages that regular developers understood. You needed to have integration with existing systems. You needed finality on the transactions. So there was a whole bunch of non-negotiable requirements. The existing systems, in which I'd argue that the fully public open blockchains didn't provide. So there's, there was a, there's, a, there's a genuine different type of problem that's, that's being solved in these two worlds. Um, um, really quickly, I, I won't labor this point, but um, that picture, which actually I may just go back to, what you discover, of course, is to get this stuff deployed in you know, large institutions, whether they're banks or otherwise, you end up with this quite interesting sort of dichotomy or dilemma, if you like, which is these technologies work across the internet. They're, collect they're connecting different firms with different levels of technological maturity, but the systems you're trying to integrate with are deep in the data centers of these firms. So how do you square that circle? And the answer is you need to build a whole bunch of new infrastructure. You need a way to deploy the node deep in the data center, protected from the bad guys on the internet, and yet you still need to be able to connect to it from the outside. So you need these things like we, I mean, our branding is a blockchain firewall, which is you know, probably, probably a bit over the top. But there's a whole bunch of extra infrastructure you have to build to square this circle, which um, you know, we spent a lot of time adding into, adding into Corda. Um, now, Corda was nowhere two or three years ago. But we made what I think was quite an unusual step for a what, what we were back then, which was a financial consortium. We made um, what seemed an unusual step to make this thing open source. You can go to GitHub, github.com slash Corda, there it all is. But that was based on a really quite, just like really quite basic analysis, which is these technologies are, they're network technologies. They have insane network effects when they get deployed. Everybody deploys the same software in a market. It's very, very hard to change it once it's deployed. So the idea that people would deploy this software if they thought they were going to be completely beholden to a single vendor, apart from being sort of like the complete antithesis of decentralization, it just doesn't make good business sense. You need to know that the software you've deployed is something that you have power, you have the ability to control or influence, but also you have the power of exit if any commercial providers or any commercial providers of distributions go bad. So we made what was quite, I guess, quite controversial at the time, decision to make Corda open source. Um, and so it's really interesting to see what's happened in that time. The inner circle is, um, is, is this is a survey from Gartner. The inner circle is what technologies in businesses people reported they were working on primarily for POCs back then. And, and Corda is nowhere. Um, what you see is you see Ethereum and expectedly Hyperledger and then a whole bunch of proprietary platforms. 
And just from 17 to 18, you see this big switch where um, Ethereum and Hyperledger are still the big ones, as you'd, as you'd expect. And then out of nowhere, it is Cordra in third place, you know, the other big open platform. And the most interesting thing there I see is the proprietary ones have slunk away, kind of sort of confirming the hypothesis we had back then, which is you know, what we executed against, which is it's the truly open-based platforms that, 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 that are necessary in order for this industry to, to move forward. Okay, um, I will wrap up in a second. Um, it's not just in um, it's not just in things like syndicated lending. The Swiss Stock Exchange has had the same idea. They're building their next generation digital exchange, their new token exchange on Corda for many of the same reasons. There's a, if you've not checked this one out, if you've not checked this out, Google SDX, the Swiss Digital Exchange. That they've got some very very big ambitions. Um, it may even sound more open blockchain than closed um, when you look at what they're doing. It, it's really quite fascinating. Um, the insurance industry is pretty much consolidated on, onto Corda for many of the same reasons. Okay, final two points. Uh, final point is uh, Corda is going strong. We just shipped Corda Enterprise 4 today. This is the Corda Enterprise 3 cake. One of our, oh, thank you. Cheers. One of, one of our, our devil. <laughs> But you should really be, really be clapping the cake. The, the best thing about working in R3 is that one of our DevOps engineers' families, the entire family bakes us a cake every time we ship enterprise, um, enterprise releases, and, um, and they're delicious. Um, final point. Um, <laughs> final point. Interoperability. Um, I picked a lot of fights last year with Hyperledger, with Ethereum, with Climatic. So you name it, I, I picked a fight with someone, um, I'm telling them why I thought we were right and they were wrong. Um, and, and it was kind of fun, but, but what it means is you, you don't talk to each other as communities probably is as closely as you should. But the reality is, you know, there won't be one winner. There's going to be a, the network effects and market dynamics mean there will be relatively few private blockchains, just as there'll be relatively few big successes on the public side. Um, but we're going to have to interoperate with each other. And my final thoughts are, I think we've got massively overcomplicated with the interoperability story. Some of the protocols I see proposed by people are just so insanely complex. I think we need to take it right back to basics. So I'd like to, maybe this, this will kick off the discussion later. I think we need to maybe just see if we can even agree on some basic principles, such as you know, I'm aware of some platforms where two deployments of the same software Software. Um, we know if they've got different identity layers or different consensus layers, they can't even interoperate with themselves. That doesn't make sense. We need to be in a position where multiple deployments of the same software can interoperate. Um, anytime we try and define a protocol for these things to talk together, we should probably make it platform independent and not assume everybody's running Bitcoin or everybody's running Ethereum because you know most people are not. You know, I mean, the two presenters here are not running either of those two um, platforms. Um, we should, of course, do it in the open. That's been the basis of, of, of Corda and, and Tezos since the start. Um, and maybe something that's you know, obviously controversial in an audience with people who are very familiar with Bitcoin every customer I speak to, for them, finality is, is, is non-negotiable. When I talk to them about possibilities of you know, probabilistic finality, or you know, it might reverse, or there might be a reorg, but, then, but there may not be, it, it's just, it just doesn't work for them. So I think there are some principles maybe we can agree on, maybe we can't, but I think we do have to get back to basics on interoperability, because that's going to be the big, the, big, um, you know, the big problem probably of 2020, and I don't think the industry has made enough progress on it yet. So I will stop there. I could talk about all the stuff we're doing, but it will probably take too long. So I will go to the end and just reiterate my points. You know, enterprise blockchains, I think they, it is a genuine and, um, and um, differentiated category from, from the examples that, that Arthur was giving. You know, this idea of bringing multiple parties into consensus so that I know for sure that what I see is what you see in a business context. It genuinely is something that, um, that people are finding useful. I've explained why we built Corda and interoperability is going to be the big topic next year. So with that, I'll stop for questions. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for the talk. Um, mm. You know, I'm, you keep yeah. saying these things are decentralized, right? And, and I'm trying to understand yeah. if you mm. could get a bit technical, why are decentralized? Because I feel you're using the word decentralized because there's like some separate hardware, right? Some nodes, and they communicate in such way that there's no central server. Versus the Bitcoin model where the decentralization comes from the fact that the incentives are aligned, not necessarily just you know, yeah. they're just different hardwares. If you can explain that, thanks. Yeah, so I don't think I actually use the word decentralization that much. I think I used it in about two places because it's such a heavily overloaded term. So, so I try and distinguish between you know, what are the things people need to be in agreement on and, and what to, what permissions different people need. So if I take Corda, because it's a platform I know, um, 
download the software. Anyone can download it. The code is, is, is you know, it's is just open source software. Anyone can download it. Anyone can change it. You can, if you want to, deploy your own network with, with, with whatever governance process you want. So what, where, does, where does permissioning or centralization come into it? Well, first one is if you deploy it in a mode where you want to know who's on it, there needs to be an identity provider. So that's a potential point of centralization if you want to run it in that way. But people put an identity provider in when identity matters to them. But that's, so that's one possibility. Second point is who validates the transactions? Do I have to rely on somebody else? Can they go bad? You know, in Corda, just like in Bitcoin, we've got exactly the same model. Trust but verify. Everybody verifies any data that's sent to them. They walk the chain all the way back. So there's no, um, there's no centralization there. But you do need to decide how you're going to agree on ordering. In the event of two conflicting transactions, which one gets confirmed and which one doesn't? Um, you can go with a you know, proof of work model, and then you've got to engage with you know, the question of well, who's actually running the mining farms. That's a proof of stake model. Or you can go with a model that guarantees finality. But that comes at a cost because there will be a set of validators that you've all agreed on up front that will form the pool will perform will, will will form the validating pool for um, for ordering you can run it you can, and that could be byzantine fault tolerant or it cannot be but um but if you want that finality right now that's that's the trade-off you have to give but you've got the choice <laughs> I, I don't know if that answers your question though maybe not yeah yeah um not if you're running it in byzantine fault tolerant mode and when i say when i say validators i think I may have misspoken. I mean the orderers, the people you were relying on to say which of two conflicting transactions did they say first, and importantly, to make sure they always give that same answer to everybody. Um, if you're running a centralized server, which you can do, and surprisingly in some cases, maybe that's the consortium case, that's good enough for some people. But in a case where you assume some of them could be malicious or colluding, you can run it, run it in a Byzantine fault tolerant case, and then you need more than a threshold to be bad before it goes wrong. But that's no different to the sort of the selfish mining attack with 33% threshold in Bitcoin or or any other, um, any other, you have to make, you have to state your assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, yeah. four very quick points. So, um, one, I yeah. really appreciate the way you've broken this down. It's yeah. probably one of the best ways I've heard people speak about uh, enterprise blockchain. Uh, Thank two, you. commend you on the fact that it's open source. Thank you. Uh, three, uh, also commend you on the fact that uh, in the way that you describe this, you don't shit talk. Um, and you explain the evolution of the internet and and the role that private consortium and public blockchains um, play in the ecosystem. So um, I have a lot of experience on Ethereum specifically, um, and I know of several protocols, several uh, projects. You know, Pegasus, which is uh, the Ethereum client, uh, which is going to be built for for the enterprise um, uh, Aztec protocol, which will allow you to uh, have. Uh, private transactions on Ethereum uh, and a lot of other different uh, uh, projects. Um, and eventually, uh, Ethereum will be enterprise ready. And when that does happen, where do you think Corda sits and how are you preparing yourself for that reality? It's a really good question. We had this, we had this debate back in 15 when we were um, beginning to design it because it, it, it effectively, it, there's almost a, if you look at just the Corda and Ethereum communities, um, leave, aside the, leave aside the sort of the philosophical differences um, that are currently in place around finality and non-finality because let's assume we're in the enterprise space with the work Pegasus are doing or whoever or, or, or I keep mentioning Clearmatics because you know, yeah, we're both based here in London. Um, the, the probably the biggest philosophical difference is, um, and it's going to sound weird, but it's around tooling ecosystems. So the if, if, so what you look at what you know, Vitalik and, and the gang did back with Ethereum, you know, they 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 had the the benefit, but also the disadvantage of going first, and they had a lot of problems to solve. They needed a deterministic virtual machine. There's a whole bunch of stuff they needed, and they took the decision, which was essentially to build everything from scratch. So they defined languages, they defined a virtual machine, a tool chain, the, the whole thing. Um, we, because we went later, didn't have didn't have one didn't have the time. Um, um, or we didn't have the luxury to even consider doing everything from scratch. But also philosophically, our view was, well, hang on a sec. You know, virtual machines already exist. You know, there's a Java virtual machine. There's a C, you know, there's a C language, the um, command language roll runtime. There's like 20 years of tooling associated with those things. So the bet we made was you could get there faster and possibly more effectively if you start with the tools that already exist and then make the changes you need to make to them to uh, to make them work in the in the blockchain world. The most obvious one being 
Java, which is what we run on the Java virtual machine, has the advantages of 12 million developers, has the advantage of all the tooling, of billions of dollars, maybe tens of billions of dollars of investment by all those providers, but it's not deterministic. So we spent a lot of time building, and it's, it's, it's been open sourced as well, building a deterministic JVM. So you can, for the bits that need it, which is just the contract verification, you can write the code in Java, but if it is not deterministic, so it accesses the file system or a random number generator, it, it will not run. So, so we made the bet that was the bet, which is to, to net it down, start with the ecosystem that exists and tweak it to meet our requirement rather than building an entirely new one from scratch. So I guess we're in a race, you know, as, 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 as we try to mature both of these platforms, you know, which one builds the developer community to, which one, which one builds the right developer community to the right size? Because they're two very different approaches to trying to achieve, trying to solve the same problem. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, we'll get one more question, then we're going to move on to the panel, so there'll be plenty of time for some more questions as well. We haven't had a, a lady ask a question tonight. Hi. Um, you show a chart uh, of comparing 2017 to 2018 with the different blockchains and how Corda uh, had uh, become a larger network. How would you say now Corda will compete with Quorum now that um, uh, JP Morgan is trying to take a lead uh, on the block enterprise blockchain sector and in uh, stable coins and digital assets. <laughs> no, I hear I'm back now. It's um, so how it's a really good question. So so there's first question, which is uh, I showed you data from 17 and 18. I guess we're all waiting to see what the 19 data looks like. And, and, and based on what I'm seeing in the market, I think the news is good, but let, let's see what comes out in 19. There was a Forbes report uh, a couple of weeks ago about just sort of the top 50 blockchain projects and you net it down and it was kind of consistent with the top three projects. Sorry, the top 50 projects are, are using um, Ethereum variants, Hyperledger or, um, or Corda. So that, that was consistent. Quorum, I don't see a lot of. So so obviously, you know, I only see the firms, that the, you know, the, the platforms that we compete against. I see a lot of Hyperledger ledger fabric um i see um you know i see some ethereum variants i see quorum every so often but um but i don't see i mean maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm blind but i don't see a huge community around it obviously there's a there's i mean i don't underestimate underestimate it given the um given the support it has and the backers it has but empirically you know practically on the ground i, I don't see it very often and, and the times when we have with times when we have, I think of um, you know, a project we did in Singapore, a more recent project um, that I can't talk about where um, you know, Corda and one other platform did extraordinarily well and Quorum was one of the two that didn't. So, uh, so, so we'll see, but no, I don't underestimate anyone, but practically I don't see it that much. Mm -hmm. 